Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part four of the A30 turn repairs. You can see you've got quite a little uh, pile of uh, working uh, amazing Archimedes here now. Yeah, so testing it with the proper cable there, you can see the exact same thing going on. It's just flickering away there. It's doing something with the floppy drive, I don't know what. So my eyes are kind of firmly on this, but it could be one of these resistors. Let's say one of those is a, a pull up or a pull down. Maybe it's detecting some signal from the floppy drive when it shouldn't be, when the signal should be pulled low or pulled high. And it's stopping it from booting for whatever reason. So uh, hmm, the next thing I might do, I might just get a bit of flux onto these uh, resistors here and just flow those just in case there's some weird thing like that going on due to this detecting something from the drive and it's maybe raising an interrupter. I don't know, there's something weird going on there for sure. I'll admit, this was an absolute nightmare, this one, to get on. Uh, for the reasons I explained before, but there was hardly any clearance and I cut out all the plastic pieces. And as a result, can you see it's bowed out? You know, it's bowing out a little bit on the outsides. This one here, not so much, because I left a strut on this side and a strut on that side. So that's the approach I would go with moving forward and my recommendation to you if, you. if you've got a super, super fine tip, you may be able to get away with it. But, I don't know if I already showed you, let me just uh, clean the tip on here. I have got a really fine point on there. It was just near impossible because it's kind of like it got a comical point on the tip. The solder was not flowing, it was sticking to the top part of the uh, tip there. So yeah, not easy to solder. You can see it ended up with one wire here um, going under the socket to the pin. So we can tidy this up and shorten it a little bit later so it's flat, flush with the board as I put these connectors back on. The main thing is the connections around here are all good now. Um, the other thing I did is when I tested this yesterday, it was still doing the same thing. Ultimately, it was this wire here. I think it went to the fifth pin along here, one of the address bits. So that wire needed uh, adding in. The other thing I did at the same time, so I don't know whether the old RAM works yet. This is the, one of the original chips that were on here. I fitted the new RAM. So we'll retest, I'll clean these up and retest these again later. But, uh, and incidentally, if you want to get these chips out, you can just lever slightly there from there or there on each side and it comes out. Um, that's perhaps not the best way of doing it. There's probably a tool, you might even be able to use a PLCC extractor to fit inside there, I'm not sure. Um, but because these are brand new sockets, they'll be all right, but certainly on aged sockets, I've perhaps been very careful about uh, levering them out. But they clip out really easy and they clip back in really easily. Um, so you can see on the underside, I just mounted the uh, two caps there. This is the wire where the SMD cap goes on the other side, and there's a ground conveniently, uh, conveniently next to that. So just put that back on the mat, it only just fits on there. Um, so yeah, the next thing I'm going to do is reflow these uh, components up here with a bit of flux. But my, my eyes are kind of firmly on this right now. The good news is, because we can hold the lead down, and it's you, know, you see the board go red there, and it starts to boot, that tells me some. It tells me the keyboard stuff's probably all right. Before we were getting no diagnostic stuff, were we? Now we are. Now we're getting. Well, I think we are. We're getting like a f constantly flashing uh, floppy LED. Yeah, I think it's having a problem with the floppy drive. I could be wrong. You know that constant flicker in there. If you just left it with the drive connected for a little bit of uh, you know a minute or two. The light then goes solid, stops flickering, and then we got to this stage. So I can't be 100% sure, but I'm thinking something uh, related to the floppy interface there. So should I just uh, go for it and swap this uh, chips I see here? I do have one. don't know whether it works. It should do. It's uh, the solders are working. Replacement. I mean, scoping things, I don't know what that's going to tell me really. I don't think scoping anything's going to help at this stage. Because I don't think it's about corrosion damage now, I think the remaining issue, I and mean, we've got obviously corrosion to clean up here on the pores and things, and a chip there to reflow, I did uh, clean with the fiberglass pen, but it still looks a mess. I don't think it's going to be a damaged trace or a short like we had on the RAM there, because those three address bits were shorting. Because I've, uh, you know, I've cleaned this bit considerably with tons and tons of IPA, but having said that, it seemed to be under the RAM, didn't it? So you never know, there could be something under here that's making a conductive connection. Maybe it's not actually faulty. But I mean, it looks bone dry, clean around there. It looks like corrosion's never got to that part, whereas some had got to the RAM. 
So let's have a look at the replacement. It came from uh, Australia, this actually. I'm guessing the person who had this, it was uh, for a PC, because uh, the old PC, XD motherboards used to use this, or um, the Tandy. Uh, so you could see, looks like a new one. It's also got a 6256 on there as well, strangely enough. You bundled the two together. I don't quite why you would do that, I don't know. Maybe they came off a uh, board together, maybe that's why he did it. Because I think it was uh, one of these guys that um, he was fixing televisions. If you looked at all the items he had on his uh, website there on the eBay, he was selling uh, components for TVs, but also some stuff from motherboards. So, yeah, I think that's probably been reclaimed. They've got a bent pin there that needs to straighten in a little bit before uh, mounting it. I think that's the right part, I'll check it. So we'll remove the old one and uh, we'll have a go at fitting this I think. So I've got some uh, no clean flux there, it's not the turkey type so it's going to evaporate off pretty quick. But uh, it might just help here, I'm not really sure the best way. I did consider using some um, chip quick low melting point solder on this actually. But yeah we'll just see, hopefully we'll lose any pads. I mean we didn't lose any pads removing those um, RAM chips there, the SOJ ones, it only lost the pad when I removed it the second time. And this is the thing, you know, you can typically get these things off the first time alright. This is why it's important you get it right first time. Points like this, I wish I'd used chip quick low melting point solder. You can see we're almost there. Please don't have lost any pads. Come on. Come on, you need nearly there. Come on. Why is it stuck now? There we go. Phew. Yeah, can you see some of the discoloration under here? It might be nothing more, look at these grey pens here, it might be nothing more than uh, that needed a reflow actually. But we've got a spare so let's fit the spare I think. So I've got some uh, fresh looks on there. I'll let it cool down first by the way, the board's uh, pretty cold now. Sometimes there's advantage in, uh, sometimes you can take advantage of the board still being warm after using hot air like that. But I'll be honest, with these, the pads, the experience I've had with the pads down there, I would let it cool. I would let the pads bond back to the PCB, because you may have a chance of uh, leaving, lifting, losing pads if it's still very hot. The pads come off these quite easy, I think, compared to other boards I've worked on. Let's just give that another quick pass. Okay, we'll just uh, carefully uh, clean around with the cotton bud. Technically, I could have just left that flux on there and used that to fit the uh, new chip, but I would like to do this just to clean up the pads and things around there and the vias and see what state they're in. You can see that, that's looking uh, a lot better. So I'm confident everything looks okay there. I just need to straighten that one pin on the replacement I see here and uh, put it in position and I'll do the same thing uh, I always do yeah so get it in position uh, anchor one point and then anchor another point but you need to make sure it's totally straight before you do that but once you've anchored the two corners inspect it again just to make sure that every single pen looks straight on the pads it's centralized and all the rest of it so here's a close-up from above just anchored uh, a couple of diagonally opposite uh, points there you can see it's looking very straight on the pads there on uh, all four sides. There's been about three pins there where I've you know I've inspected like this and I found ah one, one's just like across to the side instead of exactly on the pad. Uh, there might be one or two more I'll just re-inspect 
but the next thing to just get some flux on there and uh, drag solder and uh, I can't really show you everything here because I'm gonna have to alternate because these caps are in the way I'll have to rotate the board around the stuff but if we just uh, get some solder on here and we'll uh, just uh, drag along here yeah it's not really the right tip for this my uh, the chisel tip will probably do a better job I'm gonna get lots of bridges So I might just swap to the Antex just temporarily. I'm sure I'll get better at using this iron, but I'm not even sure I'm getting enough solder there. I'm getting lots of bridges, obviously. Anyway, if we do that on all four sides, then we can uh, clean up with a bit of the solder braid, uh, and I'll perhaps use the Antex to finish it off. I think that's what I'll do. So I'm getting nowhere fast with this. Um, I scoped a number of things, clocks and things on here. I don't see any problems, although uh, one thing I will say is that the portable scope I've got can't uh, probe the faster clocks on here, but like the smaller clocks, like the real-time clock here. And I've been looking for activity. I see activity all over the blooming place, actually. Um, I reflowed this chip here, but I went back to the schematics because I was trying to understand what could be causing this issue that seems to be, in my mind, floppy related. Because remember, it's passing the self-test, which means, well, I'm not entirely sure how extensive that test is, but it's testing the ROM, it's testing the RAM. I'm guessing it does some basic checks for the MEMC, the VIDC, IOC, uh, because there are some codes there in the diagnostic, uh, you know, the technical data that you can get out of this in terms of the flashing of the floppy drive there that can identify faults in specific areas there, uh, including some of the, I don't know, the timer stuff or interrupt stuff, I think, from what I remember, because there's quite an extensive list of codes it can actually return errors on when it does the uh, post, the, the power on self test uh, via the ROM. So, what else? is the related to the floppy drive because I'm thinking it is it's when it accesses the floppy drive because it's normal when it boots you'll always see the floppy LED come on and it goes do do you know and then it boots you I think you get the sound after that um, and that's the point where it freezes where we get this flickering constantly flickering it's, it's so high frequency it's not giving the normal diagnostic information as part of the boot here that is a fault that's something that's occurred that's not been detected on, on self-test but nevertheless it's a fault and I was trying to look what else uses the BD bus because this is this connects up. It's got the LA uh, bus for the addresses, you know, the, which is the same as the ROM uses. I think so. It's the main address bus. Well, this doesn't drive the address bus. This just uh, you know sits on the address bus. We've changed the chip. We've got the exact same behaviour, so we can rule the chip out. What does that leave? Well, the data bus, and then obviously control signals and things. I did reflow the connections around the uh, this here. I was going to remove it, but that was proven quite difficult. So I just reflowed all the ones at the top, and I put the flood filled, filled this whole area with vinegar and scrubbed everything. Flood filled it with IPA, brushed it all off, just in case there was something conductive somewhere. You know, uh, uh, like we saw under the uh, ram here. That didn't make a difference. So coming back to the the data bus on this BD, I was looking at what else uses it and uh, the uh, these up here IC 14 and 15 which uh, are used for the game ports here I think it is um, those seem to be on the same data bus that this communicates with the CPU on so I'm just taking a punt here there was some corrosion here I'm going to remove both IC 14 and IC 15 and just retest it and let's see I'm guessing it should work okay um, you know, you could remove these from a working system and it probably would still boot. You'd probably just let your game uh, controller ports, you know, your joystick ports over here. But uh, we've got nothing to lose. Let's just remove them and see if it's any different. Well, it's too early to jump to conclusions, but we made some progress. If I hold down uh, that, press delete, it resets there. It takes a bit longer than normal. I'll zoom out a little bit. But you see them out flashing there. That never flashes like that there. And then it comes up. No, it doesn't. It's frozen again. This is really weird. How has that made such a difference but not solved it? Must be something around there from heating it up. Let me try and clear it again. It came up a minute ago. That's different. Maybe something else on the BD bus is an issue as well. Yeah, it's not coming up with the UI now, but it did a minute ago. 
But trust me, what happened a minute ago is it went beep and it came up saying Risk OS 1024, let's start into the UI and then just froze. There's definitely different behaviour from removing that though. I wonder if the BD bus on the uh, ARM 250 is uh, not happy. Maybe it's actually a fault on the ARM 250. Uh, I've only removed one of the ICs at the moment. I've removed the corroded one. I might just remove the other one as well. Just to rule it out. Oh, now we've got a red screen. Well, we haven't seen a red screen in uh, a long while on this. It's ruddy mysterious, this. But it's not the ARM 250, because uh, I have just reflowed that. I put a bit of no clean flux on there and reflowed around there. I wonder if there's anything else sitting on the BD bus there, or is it now a case of the BD bus is uh, not got, because it's not got those chips on there, it's floating a little bit too much. Why does it boot when it's just been freshly desoldered? That's what I don't get when you've just worked on it there. It's hard delete. Let's clear the BIOS again. Tempted to connect the floppy drive up again. Oh look, after clearing the settings. Wow, this is weird. See, when that came up a minute ago, it was really slow, and in fact, you can see it's slow there now, it's kind of hanging. So, I don't know. What I do know is we've seen a difference by kind of freeing up the BD bus, you know, removing some components from it. That I guess are unimportant to the boot process because I would suspect that those can't be detected. You know, the joystick ports there, he might do a check there to see if the control buttons have been pressed or something, but I doubt it. I might just, uh, well, I don't know, you see, it's not getting further than that now, so, oh, I don't know, it's driving me to despair this one. Now, it's important to point out those uh, 574s, they're not what I thought they were. I thought they were 254s or 255s rather. Um, the flip flops, so I wonder if it's acting as a register. So I think it's using those flip flops uh, to read the controller ports, but it's heated around that area with the hot air. Um, it won't boot with the floppy drive connected, funnily enough. It detects, you know, it does the do do, and then it kind of just freezes. But that could be maybe this chips I see that I bought is now confusing Mars. Maybe this one's got a fault, and the one that was on there hasn't. Um, Maybe it needs a reflow, but you can see I'm in here. So, I mean, I've got no idea how reliable this will be. It's annoying um, the floppy drive isn't working because I can't get any further than this. Um, let's try connecting the floppy drive up again. And I'll just do the same thing, just quick, quickly power it on. I haven't cleared the CMOS there, so. See, so can it goes do do. Oh, hang on, now it's booting. What the hell? Yeah, there's no rhyme or reason with this, it's just... It's re really weird. Let's get a game in there. Um, there's something heat sensitive, for sure. In the meantime, I've ordered some uh, replacement uh, 574s. I need to try and find a way to stack the floppy drive on here. Let's try that. Oh, drive empty. Yeah, it wasn't empty, it's just a case of the, uh... oh no, hang on, it's saying it's not formatted. I think this drive is working, have we got a controller problem? No, it's reading that now. I had to just lift the drive up, because I've got no way to support it. I don't understand how it's working though. I don't understand how it's working. Whatever it is, it's temperature sensitive. Let me try and put the drive upside down. There we go, I can support it upside down. Wow, it's working. Can you believe it? I can't. So yeah, I don't know. I'll get to the bottom of this, I'm sure, because we have some good stability there, I would say. It's just a question of uh, how and what is the issue. 
power, a few power cycles later, it's still working. Let's just move the drive out of the way. Um, I can't really support that drive, that's the blooming problem. Let's just leave it there a minute. Yeah, so what I'm thinking is, one thing with heating here, we're heating these caps here. So I am wondering if one of these has gone, I've uh, got a problem with the CSR. That could be what it is, we've warmed one of these caps up and now it's all right. But the five volt rail's fine. Uh, but it could be that, I don't know, it's causing some sort of issue there. I don't know how those are all used. I'm guessing they're all just gonna be smoothing caps, really. Um, but we've got to take that as a possibility. It might be that these chips are all right and it is just one of these caps here. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll remove these caps and check the ESR on them, actually. Now we've got a freeze. As you can hear, so there's definitely something, there's definitely something going on. I'm guessing it's gonna stop booting there. Maybe now something's cooled down around there. Yeah, look, it's not booting again. Well, I do like this because it's interesting. It seems to be heat related and I don't think it's the arm. So let's just uh, heat the board up again. Get it? Oh, what is wrong with this fucking Medes? Fucking drive me nuts. I'm gonna heat it again. I'll heat the caps on the other side this time. Hang on. Let's try that. Hold down delete. Now it's working. Yeah, I'm going to think caps actually. <laughs> so what I'm going to do next is get one of these chips back on. The one that had corroded pins, I'm just going to leave off for the moment. Um, but bear in mind, it wasn't working with uh, either. But if we get this one back on, and then we find it, I can get it working, maybe I'll have to heat those caps up again. I'll, it'll give me some confidence that that chip is not the issue. It'll probably even give me some confidence that that chip's probably not the issue either. So I'll just uh, heat the uh, underside of this with uh, the desolder braid. I've got a bit of flux on there as well. Just drag it along just to clean the bottom of the pads here, get the solder off, but also to make it level. So it goes on nice and easy. There we go, that's one side done. So you can't see much and the camera's wobbling a little bit. So what is the relevance to the BD boss here? And I think there's none. I think it's all a red herring. I think it's a coincidence. I think because I focused on the fact that it was erroring when it was accessing the floppy, that made me think it was going to be something related to the BD bus. But I think it's coincidence. I think the caps around here are ultimately the issue, or something around here is temperature sensitive. It could be one of these resistor arrays. But again, they're on the ports and things, so I wouldn't imagine they would be the issue. Um, it's more likely to be a cap, I think. It could be one of the small SMD components. Um, yeah, so I think the BD bus is a red herring. We'll find out. If this if we stick this back on and we can get it booting by heating up the general area, we know it's uh, it's not that. There could be some conductivity around here, but like there was with that RAM. You know, it's mysterious. Only only when I cleaned underneath the RAM, you know, with cotton buds, vinegar and IPA, did the short go away. I couldn't see anything there. That was the really weird thing with that. And we do know, because it was isolated by the resistor array there, we do know it wasn't the um, ARM250. The short was at the RAM end, and the, the RAM that was originally on this is back on it now. I'm not, you know, I swapped back over, I don't know if I mentioned that. I swapped over from the new RAM to the old RAM, and they're both the same, they both behave the same way, so the RAM was never the actual fault. What was the problem was the short on the address bus on the RAM, underneath the RAM. Anyway, let's uh, let's get that back on now. So this, you see the semicircle. Something worth pointing out um, because I've seen a few of the videos where people don't always realise there are two ways to identify pin one. If you look at the chip uh, super close, there's usually a notch, a dot here that indicates pin one. But do you see the semicircle? That indicates the side where pin one is, uh, and it's the same on the board. 
And I've seen people again fitting the chip and going, oh, I'm not sure which one, where's pin one? Don't see the pin one notch. Well, the semicircle is the thing. You align the semicircle to the semicircle and you can't get pin one the wrong way. Uh, so, the, yeah, there's two ways of uh, finding and using, uh, you know, identifying where pin one is on a chip. Uh, anyway, I'll have to just uh, tack this uh, on one corner and the other corner, but I need to align it first. So, uh, I'll show you in a sec. As I mentioned a few times throughout this video, I'll be better off with the, my chisel tip that I'm used to using. It might not technically be the best tip to use, but it's what you're used to using is the key. You can see I've got a big blob of solder there. No worries, we can remove the excess later and uh, a blob there. Yeah, the problem with not having the right tip, you'll see, when I try and uh, drag flow across this, it might just uh, make a mess. Yeah, you can see it's just not flowing, but then again, I haven't added any uh, dedicated flux. There was a bit of old flux there from that we used a minute ago with the desolder braid, but anyway, let's uh, let's just give that a go. So a bit more solder on there. Let's just have a, a drag along here. Yeah, you can see I did it all right. I've got a bit of extra solder there, but yeah, I just find it easy using the chisel tip. But you can see, uh, I'm just about managed. I'm just trying to get the excess solder off the tip. Uh, yeah, you can see you just about managed it there. It doesn't go as flat as I would lie though with this tip. You get little bits stuck out if you're not careful. Let's just uh, reflow those little wires there because they're looking blooming awful. Yeah, you see, you see it smears. That's the problem I found with this tip. I bloody hate it. Oh. How annoying. I think the thing is, you know, lots of people will tell you there's good, there's rights and wrong ways, you know, best tips and tips to avoid. And I don't believe in that. I think it's what you're used to. I am used to using the tip that I've used for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Just add some extra flux on that side there as well. And a little bit more solder to the tip. And let's uh, just drag over that. There we go, that's not so bad. That side was a bit easier because it's facing me. Again, I'm not happy with the shape of the solder. Anyway, that looks alright. So, now we've done that, uh, let's go and test it again. Yeah, you can see it's working. It's still warm, obviously. Um, but it is working. The worrying thing with this, this could be one of these things that... Uh, I find that I stick the chip, the chip back on there and I clean up and find it just continues to work and then I'm like, well, oh my god, what was wrong with this? Why was it not working? Until I removed those and refitted them and... I don't know. I don't like faults like this. It's intermittent, I guess you could class it as. The real test with this, for me, really, I think, is to test this over extended periods of time. Not sure if that sounded weird though. Yeah, test this over an extended period of time. Cold starts and things, lots of power cycles. See that, there's a little freeze. That was weird, why did we get a freeze? I'm thinking about clocks now. I'm wondering if, uh, Imagine there's no crystals in the area I'm heating there, so... Oh, I don't know. Well, in some ways, I'm glad that that behaviour has come back. I fit that second chip, and uh, you can see it's doing the issue with a flicker in here. I'm going to heat the uh, board up, just to rule out that maybe it is a cap or something. But we are getting the same behaviour, so I do think I need to change one of those uh, 574s, is it 574? I think it is, I'll stick the pan but left if I'm wrong. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, switch it off, let's just move the drive out of the way. See if that's uh, any different.
I'm expecting it won't be because I do think we've got a faulty 574. Yeah. Well, I'm amazed I managed to find that so easily. So I'm going to remove the 574 again and just make sure it works again. So booting again here. Yeah, floppy drives back to normal. Booting normal. So there we go. It was that uh, 574. That is the issue. That is absolutely the issue. I'm not sure why it's just so reliable now, but we, you know, we cap some things around there could still be an issue. But the fact that chip's missing could be the issue as well. That might be why it's kind of temperature sensitive around that area. Anyway, the other possibility here, of course, is that there is something wrong with the uh, output and able selection from the ARM 250 to those two ICs for the controller ports there. That's not out of the realms of possibility. So it could have, uh, you know, there might be something wrong with it. It might never work with joysticks again. We'll find out when the replacement IC arrives. So my replacement ICs uh, arrived this morning. Uh, I've been working actually this morning, so I've not had uh, much time to think about this or to look at it. And it's going dark now, it's the afternoon, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's uh, at that time, it's like, I don't know, quarter four or something on a Tuesday. It's uh, starting to go dark, so uh, yeah, I'll try and get this on before it goes completely uh, dark in here. I can barely see what I'm doing now, to be fair. The weather this, uh, well, not really weather, but sunlight this summer year in the UK is awful. Roll on spring, I can't wait for some warmer weather. You can probably hear in the background it's a bit windy here today as well, as well as being cold. It's like freezing cold wind. But the thing is, we know nothing. I'm complaining about the weather. You'll know what it's like if you're from uh, somewhere with a colder climate. Um, you get much colder winters in uh, Norway, for example. So, pin one marking is over there. So, the writing's going to be upside down as we uh, look at it. <sighs> Try and get it uh, into position. Let's try and do this corner here. Let's just get a crazy amount of solder on there. Right, I'll just hold it. And then I'm going to inspect it with a magnifier and just adjust it if I need to, if it's not straight. So I haven't cleaned off the flux, but uh, I'm just keen to see what happens now. My thoughts here, there is a chance this is not going to work and it's going to do the fa flast, uh, fast flickering LED thing again. And if that's the case, Unless there's a bad connection related to the control signal of that uh, 574, it's going to be the ARM 250, I think. So anyway, I'll hold down the delete key to clear the uh, BIOS settings, and let's see what happens. I don't like those flickers as well. That's something that I've noticed with this. It's weird how this one behaves slightly differently than the other one. You get like that black extended screen, but that did work as you can see. Oh, hang on a minute, it's not picking up the drive. Why is it not picking up the drive? That's worrying. Yeah, there's no drive now. Look, oh god. I think there's a disc in. Yeah, there's a disc in. Yay, the drive's back. It was a bad connection on the floppy drive. All it did is disconnect the power and the data, reconnect them both, and then it's alright. Doesn't surprise me because I'll show you. There's a tiny bit of corrosion on the uh, connector, actually. The power, the, not the power, the data connector. Oh yes, so we've resolved this then. Fantastic. So you probably guessed. I took that chip back off again, just because it looked super crooked. Um, it was one of those, you know, when you do something uh, and you think I shouldn't really be doing this. I'm going to make a mess of it. Uh, it's like the instinct was there, my instinct was telling me it's too dark, you know, they had a lack of light. It was that time of the day when uh, the sunlight disappears here in the UK. Um, and it kind of went on at cro a slight angle. It's kind of crooked. So, yeah, I'm happy with that now. It's nice and straight. I'm just going to reflow again and we'll clean the rest of the board up while we're here. Yeah, there we go. That's come out as uh, good as I think I can get it. So, uh, let's just uh, clean up the rest of the board. Then we'll inspect the caps, uh, and I think finally I'll get those two little uh, memory expansion sockets back on and uh, trim the little wire there, flatten it down. I might even uh, stick a bit of epoxy or something over it. Well, not epoxy, some, something just to support it. But as you can see, that's looking uh, pretty clean. I'll toothbrush it as well. 
There we go, hulking super clean around there now. Uh, the next thing we need to deal with is uh, this corrosion on here. So I'm just going to use the wire brush initially and then the fiberglass brush and I'll wipe over with some WD-40. The pins are okay, you know, because they're kind of like, uh, I don't know, brass or copper coated or something. Uh, and then if we just uh, go over it with the uh, fiberglass uh, pencil here as well, you can see all that corrosion is coming off there. That looks uh, leaps and bounds better than uh, it did. Obviously I'll need to clean the inside as well a little. So you can see how much better those two are now compared to this one. This one is obviously uh, the worst, but I'm sure that this will uh, come up like new by the time I'm finished here. So here's a quick after shot. So you can see from the tops, they're looking alright. The actual redness has uh, mostly gone there, cleaned on the underside as well. The pins all look okay. I don't think any corrosion has actually got in there. It seems to have just been surface corrosion uh, on the actual tops of that. Uh, for the eagle eye there, yeah, you spotted a bit that I just missed probably. There's just a tiny little bit on there. We will have to obviously clean the underside of where I'm going to solder the uh, expansion sockets, but I may as well uh, just finish cleaning this while I'm uh, out with the cotton buds and IPA. Anyway, uh, I'll have a break. Let's uh, do some of the stuff here. Let's uh, remove the battery contacts here. You can see that solder is just not melting because of the prior corrosion. So I've added some uh, solder on there. It's not flowed very well because there's a massive thing through the other side of it, you know, the wire. It's quite high this as well, 450. There we go, it's come out. Um, but the solder's not melting very well because of the uh, alkaline damage. There we go, you can see the wire has uh, just come out there. Got a bead of solder there. Uh, let's try and do the same thing with this one. There we go, it's come off, hang on. Yeah, we'll just add a little bit of uh, flux onto some braid and just have a little bit of a slide on the tops of these. My hands are so cold, I can't grab the thing. It's freezing in here at the moment. See if we can turn up that uh, exposed copper there, look. Answer a little bit uh, floating on that side of thing, like lifted, not flowing. Let's give that one a go. Uh, the other thing I will do is I'm going to remove that uh, resistor there because we'll stick uh, a diode on here for the uh, battery. I'll uh, try and come in from uh, this side, I think, to get a load of solder onto the tip. And we'll just take both sides and slide that off and steal that onto the pad there. So I've still got that resistor if I wanted it. Oh, so you can see the resistor there actually. It's, just push it off, can you see that? And uh, again we'll just uh, try and clean those pads up a bit. So I've pretty much uh, finished around there. We just need to solder our battery on and our diode on. Um, let's clean off this flux here. So I cleaned up all the pads, I tinned up the whole of that trace there. This little resistor here, I got some flux onto there and reflowed both sides of it. I will clean the top of it in a minute with the fiberglass pen just to make sure it's uh, completely clean. But I mean this whole area is uh, looking a lot better now I think. Sorry and I'm blocking the shot here. Yeah, try and avoid touching the uh, case. And um, we'll just uh, tin up the uh, legs on this diode here. I'm using a 1N5711. Again, it's got a low voltage drop, like 0.15 volts. Um, and I want the band, the cathode, towards the right hand side here. Because that goes to the trace that runs all the way down the board there and leads to the uh, clock chip there. I mean, it's more than just a clock chip, it holds uh, settings and things for the system. It's like your 
but it holds your BIOS settings and stuff. So let's uh, just heat that point there. So that's one done. I just need to just uh, bend the other leg in a little bit here. I can try and uh, hold hold it while I bend it. Because what I don't want to do is stress out that one pad. That's it. Sorry if you can't really see what I'm doing there. I'll give you a close up in a minute. But if we now just uh, heat the uh, the other point and add some solder, want well, quite a large amount because the pad's quite small um, and the leg's quite thick. That should do it. So I'll show you that diode in a minute, but we'll just need to get the battery compartment on there now. So if I just turn up the uh, wires here. This is exactly the same uh, battery bay I showed in the previous videos actually, so apologies if you've already seen this uh, mod here. So our negative is this uh, the top point here. This goes down through the resistor there which I reflowed as well. So if we uh, just get the negative uh, in place, you could push it, you could push it into the hole there. Uh, And we'll just get some more solder onto the positive. Um, technically, you, can, you might be able to use either of these, but this one's the one that's uh, directly connected to that resistor there, so I think I'll go with this one. Again, just get some solder there. We'll be taking this board back out, so don't worry if uh, you know if your thoughts are the solder's going to flow through and make a blob on the other side short to the shield, and yeah, that's the sort of thing you need to be careful of. Um, but we'll be taking the board back out, because I've not uh, finished all the work on this yet. Just add a bit more solder there. I just need to clean that with uh, a cotton bud and some IPA now, but uh, yeah, we're done. So having cleaned that up, um, the copper contacts here, because I'm only going to use one cell, I'm just going to bend these slightly um, towards each other, because then when you close it, they make a connection. Um, and it's, it's reliable. It might not be in transit, you might just like uh, lose the connection a little bit in transit. Um, get the battery in there, I'll measure it in a second. Uh, stick it in the bottom one there, like that. So I've got the battery in there, close it up, uh, make sure it's on. You can see I've got some uh, double sided, uh, a piece of double sided tape on here already, not a lot. Um, and like I say, convenient place to put it is just here because there's uh, lots of space. You know, there's no components on that area of the PCB just there. And that just makes it super easy for maintainability now. Someone needs to change the battery on that. They don't need to do anything other than just lift the lid off and they've got access to the battery bay here. Yeah, so measuring between uh, ground on the test pad on the left and the uh, that pin there, on the right hand side of the bottom of that, you can see three volts there. So the next thing I want to do is get these back in. Now, I've straightened up one or two of these pins already. They were really uh, misaligned. You can sort of still see what I mean. If you look down here, can you see one or two of these are a bit bent? When you put a uh, RAM expansion in there, those ones with the pins, you know, it kind of bends them one way or another, it makes them look really weird. But anyway, yeah, I've straightened those out as best as I can. So if we just get that in place, and with a little bit of manipulation, there we go, that's back on. Just flip it over and solder it. So I'll do this the same way I would do a chip, uh, you know, diagonally opposite end points, just do two, and then inspect it from the other side to make sure it's flat and flush and it's straight. You want this as straight as possible or fitting a mo module in there that goes between the two sides could be uh, problematic. The other thing we're going to need to do, besides cleaning up the underside of here, is add one more ceramic cap. Because there were two, you know, the two that I relocated here, I had no choice to do this because of the sockets, but there's also one related to one of these slots, I forget which it is, that was needed removing as well. The other one, for the other chip, or the other slot rather, didn't need moving, that was okay. So you can see that wire now is totally flat and I pushed it right through the uh, wire there. Then I've put the uh, socket back on. I'm just going to solder that one pin, make sure you've got a join there. Solder a couple of other points, make sure it's totally flat and then do the remaining ones. So we just need to uh, clean up, it's looking a mess here. Uh, there's one or two uh, traces there where when I use the desolder station, because they have quite a wide tip on it, you know, it's removed some of the uh, solder mass. You can see the traces look a little bit silver just there just in one or two places, but it's not the end of the world. Because each of the uh, RAM chips on there has got a you know, decoupling cap, but the two slots have as well. You know, there's one near as near as possible to the positive on the slots. 
which uh, seems a bit pointless really because the expansion boards well when you use the board the ram board it goes on there it's got its own caps on the board anyway but the module won't have so i guess that's why they've done that So the final thing here now is the bypass cap. Now I'm going to use the original one that I took off. I'll show you why, because uh, mountain ceramic, uh, let me think about this, it's uh, this side here. This side has got one. Um, and it was the fifth pin down here, one, two, three, four, five, four, five. And if I measure to the cap there, you can see we've got short, that means that's the positive. So this is our positive. And then I was like, okay, well, where's the, you know, if we mount a ceramic here, where's the ground going to be? Well, the ground's the other side of that cap there. And if I measure here, you'll see, hang on, yeah, we've got a short there. So we've got positive here on that pin, negative on that pin. So if I put that ceramic cap in between these two pins here and just reflow the solder, the cap will uh, be in just the right position. It's perfect, really. Yeah, there we go. That's uh, fairly tidy there. So it's uh, diagonal between uh, VCC and ground here. Got no other shorts or anything around there, so that will do the job. So the next thing we need to do, and this is uh, again the same as uh, previous video, clean up this corrosion here. I'm just using a bit of IPA. Bear in mind, you know, you've got, I think this is like an alkaline chemical, so it could be uh, dangerous. So you might want to wear rubber gloves or something while you're doing something like this. The other thing I'll point out with this is I was like, where's the plastic shielding? Well, the plastic piece was under here. So I'll show you, I've got it out here, it can be wiped down. That needs to go under here to help isolate the board from the uh, shielding, just in case any of the connections press down. Um, and I think one or two of them may do, because I know some weird behavior when it's in here, just occasionally like, the color can disappear and you press it down and then the color comes back. I need to clean the case out as well. You can see it's pretty uh, contaminated in there. So I'll get that into the sink in a minute. Anyway, we'll just uh, finish cleaning this up with the wire brush next to get all this corrosion off the back here. And a bit of work here with the fiberglass pen. Can you see the top there has gone all silvery? You just watch this bit here. What I call that discoloration from the uh, rust. It's uh, coming away there without an issue. Well, I am officially cheesed off at uh, cleaning uh, corrosion. I'm wiping over the whole thing now with uh, some uh, IPA and then I'll uh, wipe over it with some WD-40 but that's as clean as I'm going to get it. I mean you can see uh, how much better that is looking. So hopefully if I put that up to there, can you see the contrast? Look how dirty that is. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing is with this, just uh, re-inspecting this, this was neat underneath the uh, metal shielding instead of underneath the PCB. Um, and someone had put a piece of plastic under where the battery was to support the, um, you know, to protect the board from the underneath of the, uh, where the uh, shielding is. Um, they put this on the wrong side. This should have been under there. So we're all clean there now, ready to get the uh, clean shielding back in. And uh, our plastic uh, sheets, I'm not sure which way around this goes. Yeah, it goes that way, doesn't it? It took me a few attempts to work that out. So I've just tested this keyboard. It does work. Obviously, it's got a key missing, and one or two keys don't work on here. But I'm going to swap the um, membrane on this one because this one's got a tear here. I'll repair this in another video, I think. There we go. I swapped out the membrane. If you want to see more about that, check the previous two videos because uh, I took the membrane out of one of those to clean it up. And while I was there, I cleaned up the legs on the LEDs as well. You can see they're super bright now. They were a bit dim before. But all the keys are working, as you can see. I've uh, tested every single key. No worries. So the final thing to do now is just to remove the bits of corrosion off here and get the drive back onto this. The button on the drive was broken, actually, so I've epoxied that. It's been uh, setting overnight, so hopefully the button should go back on. But when I sell this, I'll be uh, marking it as to say that the button has been glued and it may need replacement with, uh, I don't know, a 3D printed one or something. So amazingly, the epoxy does seem to have held that together. It's gone on perfectly. It was really tight to get that on and it's held together in one piece. Um, now, the main thing is with this, the main thing is when you push it, 
that's where you're putting all the stress on it. When you release it, it comes on its own. That's where the stress goes onto these. So you probably can get away with repairing it that way. It would benefit from something being stuck on the um, across the whole surface of that. I tried to stick a piece of plastic uh, over there. The problem there is, I don't know. You can see, you can see the little the piece of the chassis, the metal. There's no room to accommodate anything stuck on top of that. So your options are to either glue it, like I've done, uh, and you can see I think that's going to be all right, or you could uh, get a three D printed one. But yeah, that is quite possibly the worst drive button ever. So this drive has been uh, thoroughly cleaned and serviced, just like the other ones in the other video. Uh, so the next thing we'll do is just get the uh, screws back in here. So you can see this area here, just before I reassemble this, it's looking nice and uh, clean and tidy. If we just get the speaker back on, uh, then the IDC cable. Now I've ordered, uh, or had to order, uh, an IDC cable for this. Does it go that way? Yeah, I think it, uh, it came out this way here, didn't it? and went up like that so yeah I've ordered uh, an IDC cable for it because I don't have one spare you want like 18 to 20 centimeters I think 18 is the size of the one that's on there but I've uh, the only one I could find was at uh, 20 centimeters which should just do the job I think and we'll just connect that back up there now this is the difficult bit can you see the button here this is why these get smashed off when you reassemble it if you're not careful you've got to sort of like pull pull it away uh, just get this into position if we can is that, yeah there you go can you see my pulling it out here if you don't do that and then slide this back piece in here so that it marries correctly in fact it's not joining is it there we go like that all the while holding this button away like that then you can kind of let go now it puts a bit of pressure on there naturally on its own and over this side here you want to make sure that the clips here are over the heat sink so the only thing that's worrying me now is this button is this button raised you know if we stick the disc in what's going to happen with that button yeah you see look it's not going in i hate these blooming mechanisms here it's like the drive is not as low as it should be or maybe the button's not as low as it should be let me try and lower the button height yeah, that's it. That button, it can slide up and down on the uh, connection. So I just slid it down a little bit and did exactly the set steps you saw me do there, including pulling the case away as you ease it in. And you can see it sits in just the right position now. It's not too high so that it's catching on here. So just bear that in mind. I found some screws to go under this part here, you know, that go into the, around the transformer area. Because there were no screws with this at all. Uh, and I've got a small thin screw here. Let's just see if this will uh, go through here. I'm not sure if it's, does it marry up with the shielding below? What's it actually going into? So yeah, I managed to get a small screw in either side there. That's okay. The middle one seems to have been broken off, I think. So if we just uh, connect the floppy drive for power, that's it. Hopefully it's all gonna be good now. Yep, that seems to be working okay. Can't see what I'm doing here. This is the big problem with this. You can't really see what you're doing. You've got to kind of look over it. Come on. You've got to have really small fingers and all. There we go, that's back in. So I might get one of those uh, 3D printed things that I showed you earlier for this one as well. And then all three of them will have, you know, kind of like a complete case. There won't be a big gap on the back like that. Um, anyway, just for now, I'm going to reassemble it. You can see this one's got a couple of clips missing. Can you see here? Yeah, those have previously been broken off at, uh, well, previous point in time. Anyway, so if we just hinge it uh, backwards, easy said than done. That's it. And then we just need three screws to hold the front on. Interesting thing, I've got this, uh, I always tape these with a little note to say what, what's wrong with it. So we stuck this on right at the start, red screen, RAM question mark, well, lo and behold, yeah, there was an issue with the address lines on that RAM there. Um, it's ironic, isn't it? I ended up taking both RAM chips off, still had a short, took the resistor ray off, we still had a short. I took both the little connectors off there for the expansion RAM, we still had a short, 
only when they then cleaned up the under the, the, the ram on this nearest this side, not the one on that side, the one that had the corrosion right from the start, but the one that didn't have any corrosion, the address lines on that, as soon as I cleaned that with the cotton bud, measured again, that's when the short disappeared. Um, and I had cleaned and cleaned and cleaned around there externally, you know, before I removed anything. So yeah, that's the sort of thing that could be pretty difficult to uh, to find. It's really only a consequence of going around the address lines. And the way I do it is I do the walk test, you know, so like if I've got one probe on the uh, resistor arrays on the left hand side, for example, and one on the RAM, I measure connectivity and then I stick this probe on the next pin while I'm still on this one here. So if there's a short between them, you'll get a beep straight away and you're like, hang on a minute, we shouldn't have a beep, I haven't moved this one to its next pin yet. Does that make sense? So if you walk the probes along that way, you'll find shorts that way. And that's uh, exactly what happened there. Um, and then the issue with the floppy drive, you know, it would start to boot, sometimes not at all, but when it did start to boot, it hung with a floppy drive, pul like pulsing, flickering like crazy. That wasn't diagnostic information coming from the ROM. It had already passed the tests there. What was happening there is the, I think it was the BBD data bus. If we look at the schematic, so you've got the ARM250, and if we scroll to the right a little bit, you can see the LA bus here. This is the uh, main address bus, and we have some connections here. It's the 82C71, that's the chips I see there. And uh, you can see it's data bus here, D0 to D7. And uh, let me zoom in, see if I can zoom so you can see that a little bit clearer because I know it's uh, it's not very clear. Yeah, so address bus, data bus. So the data bus is at BD. Now if we just sort of scroll across uh, to the left a little bit. This, so this is the ARM250 and you can see here BD0 to BD7. So there's the data bus. Now, uh, as I said, I was looking for other things that sit on that. So if I just zoom out a little bit. And I scroll up. The only other thing I could see uh, is here. Just zoom into these, and obviously these are the chips that I removed. Uh, one of them, you know, obviously was a fault here. Yeah, HCT five seven four. You can see the BD data bus here. So that's uh, you know that's the sort of thing you need to do when you you think you've got a, a, a data bus compromised or an address bus compromised. You need to look at what else is on that bus. Um, generally. Um, It'll be a, a you know data bus fault. It's unusual for an address bus input perhaps to fail on something, but it could do. It depends on what it's connected to. If it's connected to logic, you know CMOS or TTL logic, you know that's the sort of thing that could be uh, affecting an address bus. If you've got a, an address bus fault, I thought it'd be worth just clarifying on the schematics there. You can see the main address bus here, LA, going to the ROM and D0 to D15. And then if I just scroll over here to the other chip, uh, again A0 to A18, D0 to D15. But actually, you know, it's, uh, if you look at the uh, how it connects, it's up to D31. So you've got the upper 16 uh, bits there and lower 16 bits to each IC. Now, if we look at the RAM, um, its uh, address bus is different. Instead of LA, I don't know if you can see that. If I just zoom a little bit, perhaps, it's marked RA. RAM address bus. It's got a it seems to have a dedicated RAM address bus, and it's the same with the uh, the other RAM there. Obviously, the data bus is exactly the same, but I think it feeds through some resistor arrays or something or something like that. Um, yeah, so you get your two lots of uh, sixteen bits again, but the address bus is RA, not LA. And if we look back at the uh, ARM two fifty. On one side of the chip here, um, it's like pin 41 to 76 or something, you've got your 32 um, data bits there. And then up the right hand side here, you've got your LA, your main address bus. So this is connected to the ROM, but it is not connected to the RAM, it was RA. And if we scroll around here, yeah, on the left hand side of the, well it's probably not, you know, it depends which way you've got the chip around, but on one side of the chip you've got R. A0 to RA9, and this is the RAM address bus. So, yeah, it's got a, it's interesting, but it's got a dedicated RAM address bus. So, I'm adding this bit in at the end just because I felt I didn't really explain why I focused on the BD data bus. The BD data bus, as you saw in the schematics a minute ago, it's connecting to the chips I see there. So, that means any requests, you know, for floppy drive access and presumably data, uh, you know, passed back from the floppy drive, all comes via that chips IC and it comes via the BD 
data bus, uh, or certainly the requests, the control of it, are coming from the BD data bus. So the ARM250, when it needs floppy drive access or serial parallel data, presumably, um, I'm not sure whether they both go through there, I think they do, it's going to go via the BD data bus. That's where it sends its instructions, if you like, to the chips I see there. If that data bus becomes compromised, and this is what I was theorising when we were getting the constantly flickering floppy drive LED, um, it's going to stop the um, chips IC being able to respond or do the correct things. And I think that was what was happening. It was not get, getting the correct instructions. It was kind of just flickering away there, wasn't it? As if it couldn't either respond to the ARM250 or it couldn't continue, it couldn't do properly what it was supposed to be doing. That was why I focused on the BD data bus. And the only thing on there was those 574s. And as you saw, we removed them and it started working. It was a bit temperature related at that point and I became focused on thinking it was something else around that area of the board or um, I even riffled around the ARM250, I didn't show that. I didn't put any flux or solder on it, I just literally heated it up until the solder points went molten all the way around. And it was just the same, we still had the temperature instability issues there. It was only when I cleaned up, just like we did with the RAM, when I cleaned up with the cotton bud and IPA for the, I think the second time all around those two 574 you know, positions where they were on the board, that we got total stability. At that point it became rock solid stable. So yeah, we had two faults, both of them caused by corrosion ultimately. Uh, one of them did create a fault, you know, the 574 was faulty. We've got the faulty one here, I always keep the faulty ICs, but as you saw earlier on, we've refitted that 574 and it started flickering again. As soon as I removed it, it was okay again. And with the new chip, it's obviously fixed. So I think the case has been cleaned in the sink, switch that off. Pull that sticker off it now. Um, this one is not too bad, there's just some light surface dirt in various places, so I'm just going to go over this with soap and water. You can see the dirt's coming off there. And there we have it all reassembled and totally fully functioning. We've got a little bit of yellow in here, can you see that? I can always retro get a bit of HO2 on there, retro by that little bit. But uh, I think you'll agree that's come out super well. Um, I may do a part four, uh, it will be super short, it's just going to be a follow on where I might just show you me making up the composite mod for this one when that arrives. You can see it's got a little bit of history here, something underneath it here, 22nd of the 5th 01. That's interesting. 2001 and 2002 retest date but I'm guessing that's just a PATS thing it looks like it is there electrical safety uh, safety test passed yeah so at some point that's been uh, PAT tested so yeah I'm, the reason I might do a follow-up is this I might just replace these I think one or two of these have got these missing so I'll uh, size those up and order some rubber feet but we've obviously got the composite mod to do to this one still um, and I may, if I get one of the little back planes, I may show you that. But also, Zarkos uh, said he was going to send me some uh, hard disk uh, modules or something. So we could cover that in part four as well, perhaps. So special thanks to Zarkos for sending these. Can't thank you enough, my friend. I have uh, really enjoyed working on these 3010s. Uh, we're next going to move on to the 3000s. If you can support the channel via Patreon for uh, as little as a dollar a month, uh, please see the link down below. Hope you found the video interesting, and I'll catch you in the next one.